right, so a couple of years ago, if not longer, somebody uh, said that they would have liked me to have tackled uh, war games in one of these segments. And unfortunately, I totally forgot about it. But, <laughs> like, two or three years later, um, here it is. And we pretty much decided right off that um, it wasn't brought up by the other person, but that hackers would probably be the other movie involved in this. Um, one I also kind of threw around was uh, Antitrust with Brian Phillippe and Tim Robbins, but um, these two pretty much seem to fit the bill together enough. Uh, but obviously we're going to start with uh, War Games, which actually took place really when the word hacking wasn't really so much a thing. Uh, and this was kind of, uh, as far as being depicted in movies, a relatively new thing, at least in the way that it's depicted. And we start off, and obviously this is 1983, so this would have been three years prior to us um, seeing a young Matthew Broderick tamper with computers and his school statistics then. Um, but here... The thing that makes um, this movie really strong, like, right off the bat, is the fact that Matthew Broderick's character here is so likable, because obviously you go forward in time, and this kind of hacker character is seen as this kind of edgy, standoffish type. Um, and the thing was, was apparently, to my understanding, in the original script, um, David actually was more of a kind of edgy standoffish type like I was just talking about but it was um the director John Badham who actually read the script and he said he felt like something was off and then it finally occurred to him and it's if these kids this age were doing this like had access to their grades and all that and could just do this stuff on a whim like it was nothing they'd probably be having fun with it so they actually went back and kind of altered it a little bit to them being more kind of brooding about it and like borderline terroristy, and decided to just make them kids who were more or less having fun with it and made David this really... In the very opening scene, he kind of shows that he's got this... Obviously he's got the hacker thing going, but he's also like a hardcore gamer, or what a hardcore gamer would be in 1983, which is... He's standing in the arcade with a shitload of quarters and doesn't take his eyes off it, even when he's late for school. And there's just one moment here, very quickly in his introduction, that kind of just says everything you need to know about how this character treats the stuff that he's this passionate about. Because pretty much any other time we'd see this character, he would be, like, it would be his game and he, it would be an obsession with being the absolute best and just trying to block out everything around him, but he actually comes, he realizes quickly that he's late for school, and the first thing he does is say, hey kid, you want to play for me, and leaves, and he's real friendly about it, and then that kind of sets off the whole thing, where even when he's doing, even when he's hacking into stuff that he really shouldn't be, there's like a playfulness to it, there's not really, there's really nothing at all malicious about his character, which makes the story work even more, because... Obviously, the whole story is that this is something that gets really, really wildly blown up, almost literally, and it's something that's done totally because of an innocent accident, uh, just because he wanted to play some games. That's all he wanted to do, um, and I feel like that just makes the movie a lot easier to follow when you have a character that just kind of accidentally fell into this and isn't some you know, standoffish emo hacker type, or I don't know if emo would have been the case in 83, but there was, I'm sure, a variation on it. But uh, he's not that character at all, and I think that's definitely a huge strength to this movie, that they didn't go for the whole making him more edgy thing. And then it probably would have come off too tryhard, too, if they did that, and probably would have dated the movie much easier. Um... So it's it's nice that they could make a universally likable character that can still be seen in the same way, the same positive way, all these years later. And then going into the actual plot, um, which is amazing, actually, um, where he accidentally gets into uh, the military defense system and basically thinks he's playing a game when he's actually 
basically starting a war. And the way they do this is it's almost like it's almost like it's kind of like a family friendly take on Failsafe, uh, the I believe Sidney Lumet movie. And then, and but the thing is, it's kind of like with the ineptitude and the stubbornness of the adult characters, it actually comes off like less like failsafe and kind of more like Doctor Strange in and in a, in a just a little little bit. Um, but and, it, and so there is something I feel. I mean, you could look at it as it's it could be seen as a thriller, sure. But I do think there is also something a little bit comedic in it that isn't always addressed. Um, with just how, because the thing is, is you can also, walk, like, there's a scene with, uh, between Broderick and Dabney Coleman where it's kind of like, we've seen, w the consequences are kind of coming from places we didn't really expect because of where we were in the movie when those were set up. Like, when he's trying to show off for Alice Sheedy, that's really how it all came to this. Number one, he really, really wanted to play a new game that wasn't out yet. And secondly, he just wanted to impress Alice Sheedy. That's all. That was all. Um, so he does the whole, look, I can book us tickets to Paris on a plane and just do that. Like, we may not actually go, but our names are totally in there and we totally have those tickets now. Um, and then when it comes back... And then Damney Coleman says, oh, so you're doing this and you're doing this, but you're innocent, you say. Well, what are you doing going to Paris? And you've got two tickets. Who's go who do you work for? And in a way, it's a very scary situation for David because he just had no idea what he was getting into. And this is just all adding up in all the wrong ways to get him in absolute tremendous shit. And then it's just, but at the same time, there's just something so absurd that he was just trying to impress a girl and just did this little thing, and it's got this big higher up like Dabney Coleman saying, you know, who do you work for very seriously? And it's just, just the way it all adds up in the wrong ways for him and just puts him in the situation is equally scary for him as it is funny to say an audience. Um, that's the way I see it anyway. I know, I believe it's actually played up to be, like, almost a straight thriller, but I've always kind of seen just a hint of a comedic element in just how all of this plays out. Like I said, in almost, like, a less over-the-top Doctor Strange love kind of way. Um, and then, um, going back to Alice Sheedy real quick, I would also like to mention something this movie does really well, is the way they use their female character, where... Once again, in any other movie that's kind of aimed at more or less a teen audience, the girl's typically there to just be the girl. Um, but she's also here for many reasons. Number one, Alice is able to just make her very, you know, charming and lovely and kind of... The love story does feel like it's... It's one of those things where throughout the movie you're just kind of inevitably waiting for it to happen. But I do like the way their friendship and kind of flirtiness is set up throughout the movie. Um, and times, like, just in little ways, like how, the, just the way they hang out together, but then when she comes into his room and he's basically lost a week uh, getting involved in this, and he's, like, got his shirt off and his pants are unzipped, and he suddenly realizes she's in his room, just actual teen things like that, before it goes into the deep shit they're getting him into, kind of brings them together. But another thing she really helps out the story is she's basically... It's a much better way of the criticism that Ellen Page gets in Inception. Where people are like, well, she's basically only exists so that she can ask questions so that we can get exposition. But it's actually really... They set it up in a very g genuine way, a very gradual way, where... The whole reason he's doing this, for the most part, is to impress her, and he's doing all this stuff, so naturally she's going to be asking questions, and he's able to explain it in these really easy-to-understand ways that come back to us as the audience that have no idea what he's doing unless he would explain it. Uh, and it, and it actually all comes out very naturally because they have that back and forth throughout the movie, which I think, which I think really does help. And it's also, like... And it, that's another thing that kind of goes on the likability of his character is how willing he is to explain this. Because if we had, once again, if this were like a lesser movie, our lead character would probably be more like Eddie Deason's character, the one he goes to to try to, the guy that's with Morichaken, who they try to figure out um, 
what everything leads to that he printed out. And we really much would have gotten nowhere because we would have just had a character saying, oh, you're all a bunch of idiots because you don't understand insert computer speak and hacking speak and all that. <laughs> um, so I really like that we do have a character to kind of play on our main character so that he can relay back to us in an understandable fashion and still make it feel natural without feeling exposition heavy or trying to explain too much. It's all done like just right to do that um, and make it feel balanced. And, but then we also have the characters, like I said, played by Downey Coleman and, all, and also uh, Barry Corbin, where the interesting thing they do is, in a movie like this, once again, aimed more or less at a teen, at a teen audience at the time, um, and it would be like this movie's being set up because they play the old guys, the old guys that don't want to move on to technology and want to do everything the old-fashioned way, but of course we see in the opening scene with, hello, 1983 Michael Madsen, um, where it turns out that human beings uh, may not always be trustworthy and they may not always have the ability to do exactly what they're supposed to do because they're human and that we should maybe do this go into technology and let machines that think for themselves kind of take care of everything and they actually kind of bring this whole they're able to play the parts without coming off like just the cardboard cutout guys that want you know everything to stay the old-fashioned way and they actually are able to make it to where an audience actually buys that these guys really it's not just for them to like cause conflict for the script's sake. These are guys that actually feel really passionate about this man versus machines debate. And it actually really makes the drive when we're getting closer to the climax, and that's becoming more and more of a conflict. Um, it just makes it work and doesn't feel like a script is just kind of working its way around to make problems for the heroes. So that's that's always greatly appreciated because it's a problem we see a lot. Um, and of course we do have, um, this, obviously we're not reaching like, you know, Douglas Rain levels here, but it is insane how recognizable and iconic the voice of the Joshua computer ultimately became. When somebody says in that voice, do you want to play a game? Everybody knows what the reference is. And then the way they're able to kind of do it in almost a uh, sinister fashion where it kind of, it doesn't, once again, unlike, say, HAL 9000, it's a computer that doesn't know it's being sinister. It thinks it's playing a game with itself that it really, really wants to win. And there's that moment when David asks, is it real or is it a game? And the computer, not knowing any better, just casually asks, what's the difference? And then that just kind of says everything about <laughs> everything this movie is saying with one line in that very, very recognizable voice, if you want to call it that, um, which I, it, it is extremely effective. Um, so there's that. The, uh, but then, after all this, like I said, I still feel like there's kind of a comedic value in it. And then there's the whole, there's a certain playfulness with the way David approaches what he's doing. But then, yes, it does get to a point to where he does realize the kind of deep shit that he's in, and we do realize just how big this conflict can go. But then we introduce um, who we think is dead the whole movie, uh, Falcon. And when we meet him, it's kind of... The movie suddenly kind of takes an unexpectedly bleak turn. I mean, of course we know that we're talking about global th thermonuclear war and all that, which is, you know, just promising devastation. But at the same time, when we actually have Falcon just... we He's the guy behind all of this, and he's like the big figure that's like been the man behind the curtain this whole time and then when we finally go see him it's just all well you know we're all gonna die anyway so let's just wait for it i mean you know dinosaurs were here and they were just gone so you know we're next whoop they do and it's and it just really kind of stops you in your tracks and you realize the really bleak directions this movie can go ali Sheedy's is actually talking to the dude about how she's not ready to die at the young age that she's at and but at the same time Obviously, with the directions we've been going, it doesn't necessarily feel as out of place as it may sound if you're, you know, hearing the details of the movie out of context. And 
it just kind of it just kind of adds this whole new layer to it, but it still doesn't lose its fun. And that's the important thing, that it's able to go in those directions, but by the climax, it doesn't feel like the movie has changed much in regards to, like, a, an extreme, you know, tonal switch or anything like that, or been entertaining like it has been from the start. It still manages to keep that throughout it, despite that, which it really... It, it, you got to. You need a really talented writers and a really talented director to pull that kind of stuff off, and this movie is able to do it. And also, things this movie is able to do is it really combines this. I know I was just talking about old guys that always talk about the good old days and shit, but and so I kind of hate to say this this way, and I wish I could word it another way, but it's you know that old thing of they don't make movies like this anymore and stuff like that, but. Even so, when you look at this movie, you do think the way it combines taking a very adult concept, like something like Fail Safe or Doctor Strange Love, and being able to take something more like kid or teen friendly and kind of combine these plots, and you see that a lot. And it's. It, it almost always fails, and it's almost always a lot more on the kid friendly aspect. Um, they kind of forget to be mature about it when they have to be. And it's really not often you see movies like this anymore that are able to take those two things and make them actually work. The 80s were, like, really good at that. <laughs> um, so the way they were actually able to combine... Because, obviously, nowadays, when you hear that a movie has taken adult subject matter and a kid-friendly setup and kind of combined them... It, it, it's always more kind of on the, the kid-friendly side and the more immature side. But this one is able to take looking seriously at the thought of global, th global thermonuclear war and still making a relatively teen-friendly movie out of it while not backing down from its subject matter. And that that is great. That is, we really, we could really use more stuff like that. But it's not particularly promising in this day and age as much. It, it, it's very, very rare. Like, I can't think of it. I'm sure there are recent examples out there, but none of them are coming to mind immediately. So it is definitely rare these days. Um, and just overall, um, kind of the impact this movie had on culture, where it was like a really key factor for people in that time period that were really passionate about computers in general, and the impact it had on them, and how there are a lot of people now who are really passionate about this stuff that'll say, well, yeah, I saw War Games when I was like five, and that started it all. <laughs> um, so that's... that's um, something that it does, like, everything it sets out to do, it does quite perfectly, and also manages to say something about the time period that it came out. And speaking of <laughs> the time periods that movies came out, um, let's shoot on over to 1995, when replacing the words U and R with the letters U and R was seen as like really cool and edgy and it was a time where a girl would be playing a video game and then you'd walk up to her and beat her and say that's a nice score for a girl and everybody's on fucking rollerblades and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's 1995 of course. Um, but uh, that, is, that is to undermine what Hackers accomplishes and let's go into that. Um, where, obviously, it's certainly got, um, this, this term is thrown around a lot, but I think Hackers is definitely appropriate. This is definitely a movie that found a cult following, for sure. And, because it really was not popular when it first came out. I think it made, like, seven and a half million on, like, a 20 million budget, uh, which is not good, <laughs> especially in 95. Um, but we start off, and we have, at the time was mostly a cast of, I believe, unknowns, which obviously you throw a rock and you'll find a recognizable face in this now. Um, but our lead here is Johnny Lee Miller, who we actually see after we've gotten his backstory, where he was a young child who basically hacked in and co practically caused a financial crisis. Uh, and so after not being able to access a computer or a phone legally, until his 18th birthday, um, 
he eventually becomes John Lee Miller. And we see that not a whole lot has changed. He is still the very first thing we see him doing um, once this time is up is hacking into a TV station. For the sake of watching The Outer Limits, I suppose. <laughs> Um, until he's interrupted, but we'll get there. Um, and he, despite his background, seems to have a quite loving relationship with his mother that's a really sweet recurring thing throughout the movie. And you may not get that vibe immediately, because like the first interaction we have with her after the opening is uh, a very casual, oh, by the way, happy birthday. As if it's... Yeah, that's by the way. Um, but no, it actually is a very nice relationship that actually does end up becoming... <coughs> an important point towards the end. And one of the things that uh, really sets this movie off is the rivalry between John Lee Miller's character and Angelina Jolie, who comes into this, who, once again, really was not well-known at the time. Certainly not near as well-known as she is now. And you may remember that um, John Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie did end up uh, getting married shortly after this movie, I believe, which means that a lot of the chemistry you see in this movie most likely was really there, which kind of seems to really help the back and forth that these characters have, even though they spend most of the movie really not liking each other too much, but not so much in that tired, we've seen it all before, they hate each other, then they like each other thing. It's not so much that, they're just really, really, really damn competitive with each other. They're like the two most competitive people on the face of the planet, and they just happen to meet. And, <laughs> and we see how this unfolds throughout the movie as their competition seems to get gradually bigger and bigger, kind of starting with uh, this whole pool prank when he goes onto the roof and realizes there's not actually a pool up there and he's locked up there when it rains. And that nice little scene where he has to come back when he turns on the sprinklers and says, the pool upstairs must have a leak. That's a, I love that delivery. It's such a... <clears throat> but the thing here is also, as it gets bigger and bigger... We eventually get into this whole Wendell Pierce competition that they have that just goes all out. And, of course, we're going to have to have the tension at some point. Like, obviously, they've got to stop competing and hating each other at some point. Because, obviously, they're also, like, rival hackers. Like, she, he's on her turf when he hacks into the TV station, and that's kind of what really sets it off once she figures out who he is. It was already there, and when she figured out who he was, it just got worse. And so, what I really like that they do here is, I mean, yeah, they do make her the tough girl who doesn't like dates and has this aura of mystery or whatever, um, which we've seen a lot before, but the way she plays it is interesting, but also, and it kind of has shades of what would make her an interesting actress down the road. But there's also a nice thing that we have here where it's, it's weird at first, until you get to the payoff. Like, you gotta wait for the payoff for this to not be weird and seemingly out of place. But what I actually didn't like when I first saw it, because I didn't realize where we were headed, was the dream sequences. Where it seemed kind of really pointless at the time, because it was like, we know that he wants to bang uh, Kate, and we know that Fisher Stevens has made him paranoid of being arrested after he's framed everybody. So why give him a dream sequence where he gets to make out with Kate and is arrested and Fisher Stevens is standing there with his arms folded? Um, but then we go on, and the payoff to this is actually that Kate also has this dream when he talks about if he loses the Wendell Pierce competition, he'll wear a dress on their date they're going to go on. And she has this very bizarre dream of him in a dress, and we realize that this is the turning point for her, the way she reacts to this dream, because she sits up, it's shot in exactly the same way his was, where he sits up after it's happened. And while he was a bit horrified and concerned, because he is paranoid about being arrested, uh, she has this very, it's like the most light we see her, it's like one of the only times in the movie she smiles, and she's laughing. And it's because of this dream, and it realize what these dreams are doing is replacing the cliche romance bullshit. Because in any other movie, it would have she would have done the I don't do dates, but she would reluctantly go on one, she'd be... Kate in the dress looking not like herself and trying to open up and then doing this teenage romance bullshit. 
but no, the only way they really kind of reach those points where it's like, oh, I think I like this person, is away from each other in their dreams. And that's how it's taken care of. So they don't really have to do the thing where they change their ways for the other person and then romance blossoms. They get to be exactly who the fuck they are through the whole movie and deal with that themselves until it finally comes to a head at, like, the last scene of the movie. <laughs> um, and that's that's actually quite perfect and kind of pushes all the cliche bullshit out of the way. All that stuff that would just interrupt the movie right in the middle and we just have to wait for it go by because we know exactly what we expect. Oh, they fall in love because they're teenagers and all that. Um, but they just completely write that off and they, yeah, he's hot for her, yeah, she's hot for him, but they're not going to talk about it until, you know, all the important shit's done with. And I, I really love that approach. Once again, like I was talking about War Games, I kind of wish we'd see more of that. Yes, critics out there, there is stuff in Hackers, <laughs> in fucking Hackers, that we should probably see more of and should try in more movies. Um, so, let's talk, and while we're on the subject of things this movie does that to do an interesting twist on regular movie things, aspects, is this villain, The Plague, played by Fisher Stevens, of all people. And Fisher Stevens comes rolling in on a skateboard. <laughs> it's very... It, it is very cheesy at the start, but I, I promise the movie does make it work. Um, and it's actually, it's actually kind of a cool shot when we first see him come riding up to Pendulette to see what the problem is when Jesse Bradford is hacked into his garbage file. And it's, and he has, he has, what is that line? Uh, never fear, I is here. <laughs> But he, he never talks like that for the rest of the movie, by the way. He is doing that. He goes in and out of that weird accent, but I think it's just Fisher Stevens having fun with this character that really seems to have no particular background or <laughs> it really anything. Um, but that's great because it just makes him... The thing about this character is that he's so gleeful in his weirdness, and I think that's what makes him so interesting to watch. Um, and we learned that his name is actually Eugene, because of course he had to have the most dorky name ever. It's like when we found out Plankton's first name was Sheldon. And it's... <laughs> and I do... But he does have some cool moments. I do love, um, the moment when he's talking. And of course, obviously, um, a phrase that's come to be known is, um, when people are basically... People basically become all big and badass, uh, when they're anonymous on the internet, and they can, like, you know, talk all big and bad to you on a keyboard, um, being referred to as keyboard warriors. Um, I really like the way the play uses the phrase keyboard cowboys. It, makes, it sounds, it sounds, he's not talking about quite the same thing, but he, it sounds much cooler. Uh, it's like, that should, that should still be a phrase today. It really should, instead of just like a throwaway line in a movie like Hackers, we should actually be using that phrase, quite honestly. And then, um, and that's the thing, too, is that he's kind of like... It's not necessarily that he's the kind of villain you would expect in a movie like this. You Like, you kind of... Like, like the character Wendell Pierce plays, and the way they set him up, like, he's the one they're really going after. Any other movie would probably just stop the process there, so... And just make the character... The villain this bland, you know, stick-it-to-the-man kind of plot to go after a villain of sorts. But I like that they actually take the kind of higher-up conglomerate thing and they actually make him kind of part of that. And the way he kind of goes in and is actually going against them while he's right there within them, and it's just so easy to blame it on the hacker kids, and he just gets away with it so easily. It's a really... It's actually a really cool use of uh, an antagonist in a plot like this. Uh, without kind of going the usual route. Um, and speaking of usual routes, another thing is... If there is one thing that probably makes this movie feel incredibly cheesy and dated, it is that it's probably one of the main movies we have to thank for the ongoing cliché of hacking in movies is basically just people hitting random things on a keyboard and just numbers and letters come up and then boom, they're like, in? And it's like, it's like the stuff, um, 
like in all those idiotic crime shows, like the CSI stuff and all that, and I think it's, what is, I think it's NCIS, the one with Mark Harmon that has that video. The video that now on YouTube is called, I think, Two Idiots, One Keyboard, which is fucking hilarious. <laughs> like, we may possibly have hackers to thank, at least a lot, not completely, but a lot for that cliche. Um, so, but even so, it, they actually do make the story and the characters work around it. Much less the story, this is definitely more of a movie that's driven by uh, how memorable its characters are and how distinct they are. Um, one of which definitely is um, Serial Killer, like Fruit Loops, as Freak tells us. Um, played by Matthew Lillard. This, was, this would have been right before Scream. And this is, this is a Matthew Lillard character up and down. I really wish... I know he doesn't get the work that he used to, but I really wish, like, even at the age he is now, he was still playing characters like this, because I'm sure he could still pull it off. This Playing characters like this has to be in his blood or something. <laughs> and it's this whole thing when, um... I love how his introduction is kind of showing the, um... showing off the mixtapes that he has, and how it's intentionally made up of artists who all asphyxiated on their own vomit. And there's, um, and we're basically explained what his deal is, I think it's Freak, basically says his parents missed Woodstock and he's just spent the rest of his life making up for it. And that's, that's, that's all the backstory we need. Um, and he has, he, and just pretty much a lot of the memorable lines in this movie come from him. Like, he is easily probably the most memorable character in the movie, when at the time, people probably had no idea who he was, and he was just kind of a side character, despite his major importance, the more the, more the movie goes. Um, but he still has those great moments like, this isn't woodshop class, and quoting, he goes, he spends the movie talking about, like, all these artists, and then he quotes, like, um, Ozzy Osbourne on the board, but then at the end, he says, like, another big quote, and then it's the Bible. <laughs> and it's like how the, the character's actually quite uh, unpredictable in a way, but in the best Matthew Lillard way possible. He is, Matthew Lillard is just a treasure that we all should appreciate in every possible form. Um, and then there's also, like, there's Jesse Bradford as the kind of, you know, somewhat idiot wannabe, of course, of course he's the first one to get caught, but it's more of like a naive eagerness to kind of be in the group, but he's not quite careful, and he does have some, uh, some really good scenes. I do love the, just the little moment that's thrown in there when he's at the, uh, the addict support group, and he's trying to say, I'm not an addict, I'm not an addict at all, as he's sucking on a cigarette and chugging coffee. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, there's characters like Freak that stand out throughout the whole movie, and he, he's the one that kind of kind of lures us in with John Lee Miller's character, where if, if um, John Lee Miller in this case is kind of like our audience being pulled into these all these side characters and introduced, you know, one at a time. And all their distinct personalities and these memorable characters really, really make this movie what it is. Um, the direction as well, it's pretty, it's pretty flashy and 90s, but there's still some clever things in there. Um, like, well, there's some stuff I'm not so sure about, like, say, after the pool prank, and then when he walks by Kate in the hallway, and there's, like, a flash of, um, like, a classic movie where someone's being choked, it's kind of, it's kind of like the stuff Rob Zombie was doing in House of a Thousand Corpses, only here, I'm just not quite sure how it fits in, um, and then there's just, there's just little details, too, like, I like the opening scene, that little moment when he's, uh, I think it's when he's hacking into the TV station, maybe, and we see his clock, and his clock is running as if it's on seconds to show the passage of time as he's doing this, I think is a really cool effect. Um, so, yeah, and it does, and obviously it does take that approach, the same approach that War Games kind of took, only to a much bigger extreme, where because we have a cast of young people, and there are heroes and all that, and they're doing edgy, you know, hacking stuff, the authority figures here are going to be as big of idiots as you can find. Like, uh, the Mark Anthony and the other guy are around kind of trying to track them. And the dude is trying to be incognito Gene Hackman in the conversation, like, by taking a big camera and just doing this right on his shoulder. And, oh, wouldn't you know it, Freak sees them. 
Um, but that's the thing, too, is, um, not only, another thing that kind of makes this work, especially in the way it was done, was, um, not only is it that the characters are all memorable, but another thing that was really interesting in a, in an era like 1995 was that the characters aren't, like, we were in this era where I think, I think Clueless was the same year, to give you an example, where we were in a time where pretty much all teen characters were shown to be, like, perfectly chiseled, beautiful people that were most likely played by actors almost in their 30s. Um, but here, everybody kind of has a, we can just say, not very glamorous look. Even Angelina Jolie, obviously, ended up being one of the most beautiful people in the world. Is not, I mean, she's still, okay, she's still pretty sexy in this, but I mean, the, like, the hair and the piercings aren't really my thing, and there, she's, she's certainly not... Her attractiveness certainly is not front and center when she played this character, is the point I'm making. Uh, and you can say that about everybody else here, and how they kind of didn't go for that whole everybody looks perfect approach. They went for people that looked like real people, more or less, like people that weren't... People that, you know, sit behind computers and are hacking most of the time and don't exactly, you know, take pride in their appearance, per se. Um, but I mean that in the best way possible, of course. Um, so yeah, these, I forgot to mention Razor and Blade also, as these characters who are barely there, but they're just enough to where they you will always remember them. Uh, their little hack the planet thing is, it's all great. So, yeah, it's definitely, it, yeah, I won't argue if somebody says it's dated, of course. And obviously it probably did bring about some cliches that we'd see in other hacking movies, or just any movies that feature anything like that. Um, but there's still definitely, it's definitely got, uh, the cult following is probably more you want to listen to because as far as, you know, like critical reception and stuff like that, I don't think, I think Ebert liked it actually, but <laughs> apart from that, I don't think it had the best critical reception. Um, but it has definitely found a following and definitely garnered a lot more respect as it goes down, even if on the surface it may just come off as, uh a 90s teen movie about rejects or whatever, so. <laughs> um, so yes, as far as choosing one of these, I think I think it's pretty clear that War Games is on the right path with just about everything. Like, when you say with Hackers, you have to say, Hackers has all this great stuff, but there's also this stuff. Uh, War Games doesn't really have the this stuff category of that. It pretty much does everything it needs to do very smoothly. Um, and definitely kind of played a big part in inspiring a lot of what came after it. So I think obviously Wargames is the way to go here, but I do like that Hackers is finding more of a reputation as time goes on. I know Matthew Lord has said in interviews that are very recent that uh, he still gets recognized all the time for this. Like he's got, you know, he's got Scooby-Doo, he's got Scream, he's got SLC Punk, but the hackers crowd is still out there and <laughs> and pro probably growing too as more people find it so like i said i think it's got enough it's got enough good qualities that the dated factors probably won't have too much influence on um a modern audience it'll there'll be some stuff in there that they'll laugh at that might seem silly and cheesy now but it is surprisingly the characters alone make it strong enough that it actually does kind of hold up in that regard anyway, and makes the movie still relevant. Um, relevant in this case meaning not irrelevant, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, it's there. It's still there, but, uh, yeah. So, that's what we have here. Uh, I have a few more coming. I think we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get into some bigger stuff and stuff I've been wanting to do for a while that, for one reason or another, has been getting put off. Um, The Mummy, as I said, will probably be Sunday, so Versus and the reviews will be switching, but Fargo will still be when it is, which we only have three episodes left of. I'm actually getting more and more excited with each week of Fargo to see where it goes, so... So until all that fun stuff, uh, I think we're done here.